Hello, my name is Nicholas Rowan. I'm an assistant professor of otolaryngology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. I'd like to thank the editors and the assistant editors, uh, both for their hard work in putting together this virtual textbook and for inviting me. And I have the pleasure of presenting to you in the Rhinology Worldwide video textbook on the topic of epistaxis, something that is very common. Um, it has a wide range of severity and breadth within our field of otolaryngology head and neck surgery. I have no disclosures and nothing to disclose with regard to this talk. So as an outline for our discussion, I'd like to first start off with a general introduction. Then I'd like to review the clinical presentation, including the location and etiology of epistaxis and then review some of the guidelines for management that we see across the literature. Then I'd like to review acute epistaxis and how it's managed, how it presents, then talk about some second line treatment options and even some tertiary uh, treatment options, as well as some special considerations before going over our conclusions, key points, some suggested readings and the sources for this talk. So by way of introduction, Epistaxis is, incre is incredibly common. Approximately 60% of Americans will experience this, um, a number that is likely probably underreported. I know that this is a worldwide virtual textbook. However, some of the numbers are not necessarily documented great worldwide, but needless to say, this will uh, account for a large number of patients and many people that we know, possibly even yourself, have suffered with this um, acute pathology. About 10% of patients who experience epistaxis will seek some sort of emergency medical attention. In the United States, it uh, accounts for 1.2 million annual emergency department visits, so those seeking acute care, and it's actually responsible for one-third of all otolaryngology-related emergency department visits and encounters, so a very large number of patients that experience this pathology and seek out care for it. Epistaxis in general is most common in the older and younger patients. It has a bimodal distribution, being common in patients aged less than 10 years of age and common in uh, patients greater than 70 years of age. As many of us know, there are many predisposing conditions that are responsible for epistaxis, especially uh, something worthwhile to consider and something that we'll bring up again and again throughout this conversation is that uh, patients at older age are in increasing risk for anticoagulation status and more likely to have nosebleeds because of that or other pathologies, very common pathologies they may experience, such as hypertension. So going over the clinical presentation of epistaxis, this is exactly what we all know and expect. Very simply put, this is a nosebleed. Uh, it's important to distinguish between the two main types of epistaxis, and that is really just based primarily on location. So anterior epistaxis, or coming out the front of the nose, is the most common type of epistaxis. It can and may be self-limited. It may uh, begin quickly on sp with spotting on a tissue, or may be dramatic in nature. It presents as gushing. Um, it may be one-sided, it may be both-sided. It may come out the front, it may go down the back of the nose. Um, it may begin on one side of the nose and go to the other side and then go down the back. It can really present quite acutely and dramatically, even smaller bleeds. They may last in a shorter to longer duration. A lot of this depends on the inciting event. If there's an obvious trauma, it starts immediately at the time of the, at the, time of the tra trauma, hopefully subsiding uh, shortly thereafter. Whereas other situations, it may be um, uh, something that mounts over time. It is progressive in nature. It starts slowly and starts to increase uh, substantially. So anterior epistaxis, again, generally described by its clinical presentation in that it's coming out the front of the nose. It can be stopped by pressure. It's isolated, self-limited. Whereas on the other hand, posterior epistaxis accounts for a much smaller percentage of all bleeds. Five to 10% of these of all epistaxis may be considered as posterior epistaxis. And it's typically oftentimes described uh, with its history in that it'll present with a brisk, uh, very rapid bleed. Oftentimes patients will report that this type of bleeding goes down the back of their throat. Patients may have predisposing factors, especially patients who have had prior surgery. Uh, 
or those who have some sort of mass or lesion or reason to have bleeding from the back of their nose, but certainly a large proportion of patients with posterior epistaxis may present and be uh, spontaneous in nature. Really, the clinical diagnosis is made that you cannot visualize this source of bleeding on anterior rhinoscopy, that is either shining a light or putting an endoscope in the front of the nose and you're unable to, um, uh, to identify the source. It is oftentimes also diagnosed by the clinical history and the clinical management in that traditional and common anterior packing does not work for posterior nasal bleeding given the nature of the bleeding from the back portion of the nose where pressure is not as easily applied. Posterior epistaxis most commonly occurs in older patients, and again, it's more difficult to control. So if, for instance, somebody receives an anterior nasal pack and they continue to bleed, or uh, and over my personal anecdotal history, oftentimes what you'll see is somebody who has bilateral nasal packs and they still continue to bleed. That should give you a pretty good indication that it's coming from the back of the nose because the front of the nose is fully compressed. Again, location for the description of epistaxis is very important. Anterior epistaxis typically being uh, from the front of the nose. As we can see here from a, um, a, uh, a reuse of the clinical practice guidelines recently published by the American Academy of Otolaryngology. And the figure here on the left, anterior bleeding typically comes from uh, Kesselbach's plexus, also known as Little's area which is a convergence of, our, of small vessels that ultimately originate from the superior labial artery, the greater palatine, and the uh, potentially even the anterior ethmoid and the sphenopalatine. These are very small contributions. Typically, these bleeds can be controlled um, pretty easily and readily identifiable. You can look just in the front of the nose using, using a nasal speculum and your naked eye, and you can see this area the large majority of epistaxis, especially those that come from anterior, come from this area known as Kesselbox plexus. Whereas on the, uh, on the right-hand panel there labeled B, the bleeding may come from uh, arterial sources towards the back of the nose, the most common being the sphenopalatine artery and the smaller arteries that, um, that originate from this, uh, from this terminal branch of the internal maxillary artery. Uh, very commonly, we, are, we discuss the dorsal septal artery, which goes along the arch of the coena or the arteries that supply the, um, the middle turbinates. Also in this region are the uh, greater palatine artery, which is in the uh, posterior most aspect of the medial maxillary wall. And uh, both uh, contributions may occur in the back of the nose from the anterior ethmoid artery and the posterior ethmoid artery as well. Moving along, discussing the, uh, the etiology of these bleeds. Again, many of these patients uh, and nosebleeds are spontaneous in nature without any sort of obvious etiology. They may be completely sp sporadic in nature. In other situations, patients may have some sort of progressive history where they had small bleeds that began when they were blowing their nose. It began on a tissue. It became progressive over time. Maybe they had some crusting in their nose. Um, they may have sustained some digital trauma, removed the crusting had bleeding or they blew their nose very hard, perhaps had a small trauma in the front of the nose, some sort of obvious kind of inciting event. Um, and that's a pretty common history. Um, and oftentimes it's really hard to know what exactly caused this. Other things need to be considered though are certainly other common things uh, such as patients who are anticoagulated, potentially even patients who have underlying bleeding disorders. Certainly you should be thinking about systemic diseases. Uh, again, thinking about bleeding disorders, patients with hematologic pathologies such as dysfunctional clotting cascades or low platelets, or if, these, if this hematologic condition, again, is, uh, is given by medical therapy, such as they have platelet dysfunction in the setting of aspirin or Plavix usage. Cardiovascular history, um, patients who have hypertension, one of the common ways that hypertension may actually present is with anterior epistaxis. Patients with hepatic and or renal dysfunction may have dysfunctional platelets um, that will also cause them to be likely to bleed from mucosal surfaces. Again, this will be a very common area to begin bleeding of any sort, given the superficial nature of the vessels that underlie the nasal mucosa. Certainly patients who are post-operative in nature, so those who have undergone 
uh, nasal surgery or sinonasal surgery. They may have gone, undergone endoscopic and nasal skull base surgery, which predisposes them to bleeding and is certainly worthwhile considering in the etiology of their bleeding. Patients may have neoplasms as those as such as this one shown here. There is a lesion growing between uh, the, uh, the nasal septum pictured on the right side of the screen and the inferior turbinate on the left. The, uh, the middle turbinate is completely obstructed and actually invaded by a tumor uh, that has large vessels overlying the surface of this lesion. Um, and the patient presented with unilateral epistaxis. So that's certainly something also to keep on your differential diagnosis. Uh, in addition, there are other uh, uh, genetic disorders that may present with nasal bleeding, such as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, in which approximately 96% of patients with this genetic disorder have and present with nasal bleeding, or those with SMAD4 mutations um, who also may have nasal telangiectasias and colonic polyps and a variety of other genetic disorders. So it's important to remember that although this is a very common pathology that patients may experience, um, and it may be isolated and self-limited -limit, and not really have an obvious etiology other than uh, mucosal disruption in Kessebox plexus or the anterior aspect of the nose, it is also worthwhile to consider that there are many other considerations, especially when patients have recurrent or recalcitrant uh, issues with epistaxis. I'd like to next quickly focus on the guidelines for management and uh, start off by saying that there are many um, recent guidelines that have been published on this topic. And I suspect that whenever you are listening to this virtual textbook chapter, there will continue to be updated information. And so the, um, the guidelines that are gonna be shown in the next few slides have been published within the past few years. However, this is something that will continue to be very important for patient management. And as medical management continues to always advance, and um, at the same token, patients have additional uh, diseases and or side effects of other medications, which is another source of epistaxis, uh, these are some, this is something to constantly refer back to and uh, review the most recent evidence-based guidelines. The guidelines that are available currently have many consensus statements with associated recommendations. Oftentimes, these documents, uh, regardless of who they are collated by, have algorithmic recommendations and review some of the special considerations um, for all different uh, etiologies of bleeding, as well as different treatment options. I think that it's important to highlight again, just how common this is and how important it is for the management, wherever you are in the world managing patients with epistaxis. As you can see here, even over the last handful of years, um, in addition to the, uh, the uh, British Rhinological Society providing uh, multidisciplinary consensus uh, guidelines for the hospital management of epistaxis, the American Academy of Otolaryngology has put out clinical practice guidelines on epistaxis within the past two years. Um, and the French Society of Otolaryngologists actually has multiple guidelines for uh, the uh, different types of management of, of epistaxis, including second line treatment in the setting of high blood pressure um, and the standard uh, kind of first line therapies that are available for treatment of epistaxis in adult patients. Um, being an American presenter to a uh, worldwide audience, I realized that I don't want to be too U.S. centric. Uh, however, I do think that the American Academy of Otolaryngology Clinical Practice Guidelines, which is readily accessible, um, has uh, some really nice presentations and is worthwhile considering as a suggested reading and as a source for um, consideration when discussing uh, and managing patients with epistaxis. This guideline is incredibly extensive. It's an incredible resource, an excellent resource for uh, primary care physicians, emergency physicians, and first responders, and even uh, otolaryngology trainees and medical students. So perhaps if you're an otolaryngologist uh, watching this virtual textbook chapter, this may be something worthwhile considering distributing to your peers. This uh, uh, document is tens of pages long and benefits from some really nice algorithms that um, really consider all of the different nuances of patient care 
um, ranging for whether there's a need for nasal packing, what happens when first line therapies fail, um, what the second line, uh, second line therapies will be, what the uh, appropriate tertiary care will be, and then special considerations such as um, uh, anticoagulation status, bleeding disorders, and in addition to this, it reviews all of the evidence that is, was published at this point in time and is collated into an evidence-based driven uh, guideline statement. Um, and it actually shows the level of evidence that, uh, that is behind each one of these recommendations, which is, um, which is really nice and it's worthwhile discussing. So acute epistaxis, how do you manage it and what do you do? So um, imagining that you're in a setting that is either in office or it's at bedside in an emergency room or somewhere, somewhere kind of relatively acute, the first line in management uh, and the first step in management is completing a comprehensive history and physical examination uh, as much as you are able to. It is important to focus on the history, such as asking, uh, asking first about the, lateral, the laterality, the past history of epistaxis, the duration of bleeding, whether it's coming out the front or whether it's going down the back, um, and the general characteristics of the bleeding, if there's any sort of inciting event, whether it's stopping or um, uh, starting repeatedly. And then once the, uh, the details and the characteristics of the bleeding are reviewed, it's important to review the patient's medical and surgical history and medication uh, usage, which are really the most pertinent. Again, thinking about systemic disorders that may cause epistaxis that might need to be managed in addition to the patient's bleeding, that might be the underlying source of this, as well as medications that may need to be reversed, such as anticoagulation, or perhaps they have a history of nasal surgery, um, which, uh, which may change the situation dramatically, especially depending on the type of surgery they've had, whether they might have had nasal surgery or they had um, sinus surgery or even perhaps endoscopic uh, endonasal skull base surgery. If perhaps nasal surgery is performed, the bleeding might be able to be managed with topical um, uh, vasoconstrictins uh, or even a small amount of packing anteriorly, whereas the consequences of packing somebody's nose following an endoscopic and nasal skull base surgery might be a bit more dramatic um, given the uh, potential defects in the skull base uh, further in the nose in one of these situations. The examination should consist of uh, vital signs, uh, head and neck examination, uh, cardiovascular exam, respiratory, uh, especially in the sitting, setting of acute bleeding, um, you should always think about airway status, and this should, uh, just like any situation, the uh, uh, airway breathing circulation uh, mnemonic of any sort of basic life support should be considered in any sort of otolaryngology evaluation. Uh, following that, nasal endoscopy, anterior endoscopy, and nasal endoscopy should be performed to evaluate the potential source of bleeding um, and uh, potentially evacuating any clots from the nose if there is um, uh, making sure that the uh, nose is able to be thoroughly evaluated. Next, if somebody is presenting to you with acute anterior, uh, anterior epistaxis or what you think is anterior epistaxis, typically the, uh, the topical, the, uh, the uh, uh, treatment algorithm includes some sort of topical vasoconstriction. So something like oxymetazoline or neosinephrine and local pressure. Um, should be used for, for uh, the most acute management. Um, if perhaps a lesion is identified, um, a nasal cautery could potentially be considered, but that's not always necessarily the next, the next best step of management. Uh, perhaps patients are anticoagulated and manipulating their nose is, uh, presents a unique challenge of uh, potentially increasing the amount of bleeding that is performed one may want to consider absorbable nasal packing. If on the other hand, patients have continued bleeding or they have a history of bleeding over and over again, uh, perhaps something more robust is needed. Um, uh, and any kind of nuanced variation of that, which is described here, is the typical kind of characteristic and classic management of anterior nasal bleeding. Again, starting with uh, topical vasoconstriction and pressure that is applied to the front of the nose being the the mainstay of therapy and of the large majority and millions of patients that will have this pathology, 
Um, that's a good kind of, that is a good first line management strategy. With regard to nasal packing, um, this is the mainstay of therapy. So when somebody's bleeding, if perhaps they had an exterior bleed on their, on their arm or their hand or somewhere else in their body, you need to apply pressure, the nose is no different. And so uh, when uh, an individual treating and managing somebody with acute epistaxis in an office type or an emergency room type setting should consider uh, different packing options. Those can be absorbable packing options, such as those shown here on the right side of the screen, which may includes, include oxidized regenerated cellulose or a chitosin-based polymer, which is a, uh, is, is a preference of mine currently, but that has changed over the years. Um, certainly, different types of sponges of different proprietary sources may be used and tolerated quite well. There are many options that are available um, as a provider myself. I actually change my man management strategy depending on the location that I'm at because of the resources available. And so there is no uh, single uh, absorbable packing option that is, uh, that is certainly the one that you need to use, but rather the resources that are available to you and certainly something as a provider that I consider personally as my own uh, uh, nuanced care of patients is I consider cost of the packing and certainly try to make this as cost effective and less burdensome on the healthcare system as possible. When it comes to non-absorbable packing options, there again are a variety of different options made by a variety of companies. They range from sponges with varying length from a, uh, a couple of centimeters to just pack the front of the nose to a bit longer, uh, up to as long as approximately 10 centimeters in their length to reach the back of the nose, the posterior nasal cavity, and even the nasopharynx. There are uh, non-absorbable packing options that have uh, inflatable, that are inflatable catheters, either one or dual balloons. You uh, certainly can consider the use of uh, uh, gauze, strip gauze packing, which is um, uh, a more traditional, uh, um, uh, older kind of uh, treatment option that uh, oftentimes um, may not be used in the setting of the availability of inflatable catheters. Um, and certainly if you need to be creative uh, in, in some situations as a provider, something that I have used is a Foley urine catheter um, to uh, place into the nasopharynx, uh, fill with air and uh, fill with air, excuse me, uh, fill, fill with uh, saline to fill the balloon, fill nasopharynx to prevent blood from going down to the patient's nasopharynx and into their airway. When patients have uh, anterior uh, bleeding uh, that you seemingly cannot control, certainly a, uh, a, a thought that should cross uh, the provider's mind is that the patient's having posterior bleeding. And so when, for, to when typical first line anterior epistaxis uh, packing uh, fails, certainly you should be thinking again about protecting a patient's airway. There's blood that's potentially going down the nasopharynx with direct access to the larynx and the trachea. And so protect the airway number one, make sure that the patient is seated in an appropriate position so they're able to evacuate the blood. The blood's not going down the back of their throat. There's pulse oximetry available and um, uh, suction as well to prevent uh, further blood from escaping down into a patient's airway. There are additional non-absorbable packing options, some of which were mentioned on the previous slide um, to prevent this, uh, especially when the uh, situation is dire, things again like a Foley, uh, Foley catheter placed in the nasopharynx full with nasal saline will prevent any egress of blood down to the nasopharynx um, and protect the patient's airway. So once uh, nasal packing in the kind of traditional uh, uh, first line treatment options fail, such as topical vasoconstrictions, pressure, and uh, packing options and or cautery. Certainly, um, again, posterior packing is something that you can always use to temporize um, uh, bleeding when anterior techniques fail to control the continued bleeding. There are other interventions that are available, such as surgical in intervention and endovascular embolization. Um, uh, certainly like this picture uh, demonstrates on the right side of your screen here, which shows a uh, somewhat brisk arterial that is bleeding from the region of the sphenopalatine artery. Um, uh, posterior nasal packing may temporize this type of bleeding. However, ultimately, 
Uh, the concern is that once packing is removed, there will be continued bleeding. And so more definitive treatment strategies will be required. There is a uh, ongoing debate in the literature talking about the discussion between using these uh, second line treatment options that are both list listed here, uh, including surgical intervention and endovascular embolization. Um, some of that is, uh, again, uh, dependent on uh, the resources that are available to the, to the provider, the etiology of the bleeding, the comfort of the provider, and some of the patient factors, um, some of the medical comorbidities that may prevent patients from going to an operating room, for instance, which may make them at too big of a risk for general anesthesia that is required for um, uh, that is required for some of these interventions listed here, such as phenopalatine artery ligation or anterior ethmoid artery ligation. Um, endovascular embolization options include embolization potentially of the phenopalatine artery, which again is fed by the internal maxillary artery, or the uh, branches of the facial artery, which may also have contributions to the nasal cavity. So going a bit more in depth into surg surgical arterial ligation, the sphenopalatine artery ligation is the most common, and it's an increasingly common, uh, uh, especially as something seen here uh, in the United States. The uh, anterior ethmoid artery uh, ligation is something that is really maybe even considered a tertiary, um, a tertiary type of surgical intervention after the second line therapy fails may be required. Um, these can be done via an open or an endoscopic approach. Uh, oftentimes bleeding may be quite challenging. If patients continue to have brisk bleeding endonasally, the open approach may need to be pursued using a Lynch incision to access the anterior ethmoid artery um, in the setting that something like a sphenopalatine artery ligation fails or the bleeding is too brisk to safely remove and visualize the, um, the bleeding endonasally. Bleeding during sinus surgery, such as this video, which is shown here, um, is uh, uh, fairly common. It's something that's uh, um, encountered when the dorsal septal artery um, uh, is uh, uh, transected, performing either a sphenoidotomy or, a, uh, or uh, uh, the inferior one third of the superior turbinate is resected. And this is actually quite uh, common and uh, subsequently pretty easy to control, typically something with monopolar cautery, suction monopolar cautery con to control this bleeding um, with a small piece, piece of absorbable packing over top of it to make sure that it does not continue to bleed again. Going a little bit further in depth into sphenopalatine artery ligation, again, it is, uh, it is something that is increasingly commonly used in, uh, with the increasing familiarity of uh, endoscopic techniques. Previously, it was a third line therapy and in some situations and in many institutions uh, um, across the US, it is actually an effective alternative to posterior nasal packing. Um, there are several reports um, and a growing consensus from the, within the literature that at this current time, um, given the high rate of success, um, reported success rates averaging around 90, 98%, and low post-operative hemorrhage rates in about 3.4% that um, perhaps this may be an option to getting patients out of the hospital sooner, pre preventing patients from requiring posterior nasal packing, improving patient comfort, and more definitively uh, dealing with the uh, ultimate etiology of the patient's bleeding. Again, uh, the concern always is that in the setting of, a, of posterior nasal bleeding, once the nasal packing is removed, there is certainly a concern of recurrent, um, uh, re recurrent hemorrhage uh, because the ultimate etiology of this was not addressed. So some representative pictures here. Um, uh, the first is uh, on the far left of the screen here, uh, demonstrates a surgical dissection showing the sphenopalatine artery at the posterior superior aspect of the left maxillary sin sinus. It is showing the uh, crista ethmoidalis, which is on the medial maxillary wall, which is a key landmark for identifying this foramen where the artery exits uh, just above uh, the inferior turbinate and um, uh, below the left ethmoid sinus. Um, this can be done in a, in a cadaver. Uh, it can be done with or without. Um, uh, it can be done in a cadaver for, uh, for training purposes as demonstrated here. 
um, in, in uh, uh, surgery. It can be done with or without a maxillary antrostomy. In this cadaver picture shown here, there is a maxillary antrostomy. I personally do prefer to perform a maxillary antrostomy at the same time so I can visualize the orbit and very uh, easily uh, identify the crista ethmoidalis as well as give a uh, location for blood to pull into um, while these cases are happening, sometimes there is a substantial amount of blood loss. Um, the next two videos are compliments of Dr. A Andrew Thambu. Um, thank you again for providing these, Andrew. And uh, first is the identification of the sphenopalatine artery, which is coming out uh, just posterior to the, uh, to the, uh, the crista ethmoidalis on the uh, uh, left medial maxillary wall here. Um, and once the artery is identified, it can be uh, transected using bipolar cautery. It's very important that once the artery is, uh, is cauterized, it is subsequently transected as uh, in a number of cases, there is and are additional branches from this artery in this region, which uh, should ultimately be transected and ligated and uh, controlled for any addition of uh, uh, additional post-operative bleeding and post-operative hemorrhage. Endovascular embolization is certainly an option for is certainly an option for patients with uh, uh, recalcitrant bleeding and those with uh, posterior epistaxis. The average success rate of endovascular embolization is a bit lower in the reported literature as compared to um, as compared to the surgical cases. Uh, though I am a surgeon, and I have my own biases. It is important to think that um, there are likely biases within the literature. Again, as I mentioned, not all patients are surgical candidates and likely the population of patients undergoing endovascular embolization is a larger pool, um, likely diluting the ultimate amount of success for patients undergoing this procedure. Um, so again, this is a bit uh, lower success rate than those patients undergoing surgical options. Um, and that may not just be secondary to uh, a theoretic superiority of surgical options, but secondary to the patient population that undergoes these types of procedures. Certainly there are patients that undergo embolization that are not surgical candidates. Um, the uh, complications of endovascular embolization are certainly worthwhile considering, whereas patients who undergo uh, uh, endonasal surgical ligation of arteries and they have the typical risks that are associated with any sort of uh, endonasal or sinonasal manipulation, the uh, endovascular embolization uh, has associated risks of minor transient complications in 20% of their patients, ranging from pain on the side of their face, headaches, even some localized swelling, some jaw claudication, trismus, or even some access site complications in either their groin or their risk. Um, and these are, uh, these are typically transient in nature, bothersome for, um, in, in my experience, several days, and they ultimately go away and uh, they're not very worrisome. However, it is worth noting that there is a risk of major complications such as skin or nasal necrosis in the, extensive, in the setting of extensive embolization, certainly uh, permanent facial nerve paralysis, monocular blindness, and even stroke. It is also worthwhile noting that uh, for endovascular embolization, patients with anterior ethmoidal bleeding, which is, which is one of the most common causes beyond the sphenopalatine artery of uh, recalcitrant epistaxis, um, patients with anterior ethmoid bleeding are not uh, candidates for endovascular embolization because this artery, the anterior ethmoid, is a branch of the internal carotid artery, meaning that uh, the risk of uh, stroke is uh, substantial in these patients secondary for refluxate of the embolization material into the, um, into the uh, terminal vessels of the internal carotid artery um, intracranially. And that is certainly so, a point worth driving home. And so I'll say it again, that if patients are having bleeding from the anterior ethmoid artery, they are not candidates for endovascular embolization at this point in time. Certainly some special considerations to think about when patients have uh, bleeding. Uh, the anticoagulated patient is something that uh, many of us uh, as uh, otolaryngologists and otolaryngology trainees will increasingly uh, encounter, especially as we have a growing aged population. 
Uh, many of these patients uh, uh, are anticoagulated. They may have a range of different anticoagulants ranging from something that is very common, such as a antiplatelet therapy, including aspirin, or uh, something like clopidogrel or another antiplatelet agent, um, to a irreversible type of uh, anti, uh, anticoagulation, uh, ranging certainly something that is very common like heparin, which uh, is indeed reversible, or warfarin, to newer uh, anti-factor agents, which have, uh, um, are less likely to have uh, a therapeutic that can be used to immediately reverse it. Certainly when patients have anti, when they are anticoagulated, all of the typical first line treatment strategies should be considered. So topical vasoconstrictants, local pressure, absorbable packing should be favored and preferred. Um, and that's because eventually these patients are likely going to be on their anticoagulation therapy and the packing, if it's not absorbable, will have to be removed from their nose. When this is removed, there is, a, there is another opportunity to remove a scab um, from the patient's nose, and uh, can, you can actually incite bleeding by removing the packing. And so not having to physically remove or debride these patients who are anticoagulated um, it is, is preferred. Uh, an absorbable option is really the kind of the first line therapy. Certainly you can consider reversing whatever anticoagulation therapy they are on. Um, you may need to consider earlier in the uh, course of their bleeding to, um, to give them a blood transfusion. And certainly, um, although many of us are uh, wonderful doctors, there should be a, a, a discussion with the person who is providing the patient with um, uh, the anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy if if that is available, and uh, certainly the indications at minimum for anticoagulation status should be reviewed, um, as sometimes that removing this or withdrawal of the anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy may actually increase the patient's risk for other sort of medical complications uh, quite drastically. So this is uh, uh, not a consideration that should be taken very lightly. In addition, as I mentioned in the uh, I mentioned in the introduction, there are certain genetic conditions that uh, many of us may encounter that uh, present with nasal bleeding, and one of them that is worthwhile discussing and that is reviewed in the American Academy of Otolaryngology Clinical Practice Guidelines is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, also commonly referred to as HHT. Um, this is an autosomal dominant uh, genetic disorder that is uh, uh, progressive throughout life and may present at an early age, but typically patients present at mid to late age with progressive severity of their disease over time. They have a very characteristic phenotype with uh, small telangiectasias that are typically seen inside their nasal cavity and the anterior one third to one half of their nose. They may be on the nasal septum or the inferior turban as demonstrated here on this picture. They may also be on the nasal floor and the middle turbinate. Typically, the posterior nasal cavity and the nasal pharynx is, uh, is free of disease and, uh, and lesions. Patients will also have lesions on their tongue in their oral cavity, sometimes on the roof of their mouth, their buccal mucosa. Certainly, their risks, uh, excuse me, their lips are at risk for having these lesions. You may see lesions on the pinna uh, of their ear or anywhere on their oracle. Another characteristic place to see these lesions are the pads of their fingers, and so a good digital examination um, may be worthwhile considering if perhaps the patient's uh, nose is too full of uh, old blood to really kind of see exactly what's going on. Maybe perhaps you're concerned that you see some red spots um, in, their, in their oral cavity. In patients with HHT, the traditional treatment strategies are, uh, are less effective. And so with 96% of this patient population having substantial issues with nasal bleeding and epistaxis, it's worthwhile considering alternative treatment strategies. Um, certainly absorbable packing options, topical procoagulants. Um, really, these patients should be evaluated by a provider who's familiar with HHT. Um, in the past, many uh, patients with HHT have undergone repeated, um, uh, repeated cauterizations without improvement, which ultimately leads to complications uh, endonasally, such as a septal perforation, which actually promotes bleeding and causes additional problems for these patients. Uh, 
There are many unique strategies that are available for patients with HHT, including uh, topical copulation, uh, laser therapies or sclerotherapies. Unfortunately, the literature is quite mixed on uh, the efficacy of these therapies, um, with really the only uh, high level of evidence demonstrating uh, effective therapy and the need for decreased trans transfusions, which is a primary concern for chronic blood loss of these patients, is systemic uh, uh, bevacizumab, which can also be injected locally. In the past, it's been used as a topical spray or an ointment. However, uh, again, the evidence supporting the use of these uh, unique products is, uh, is, is a bit limited. There are several ongoing trials um, in the year of 2022 with uh, systemic therapies, uh, anti-VEGF and other um, uh, um, uh, novel chemotherapeutics that can be taken orally as opposed to some of the more traditional systemic infusions that patients have been on, again, like bevacizumab or some of the anti-estrogen therapies, um, which are often last, uh, which are uh, third and quaternary um, uh, level considerations for these patients with substantial disease. Again, it is important to monitor their overall um, uh, blood counts and make sure that they're not anemic. They should be transfused if they need to. There are several well-written uh, clinical practice guidelines for the management of patients with HHT, including uh, systemic screening, screening for um, arteriovenous malformations that more, may form elsewhere in their body, such as intracranially um, in their chest as pulmonary AVMs or in their gastrointestinal tract. So in conclusion, it is, uh, again, incredibly common to encounter epistaxis. In most cases, the bleeding is anterior in nature, um, and figuring out the etiology and the location of bleeding is really critical in the management of patients with epistaxis. Posterior bleeding is generally more difficult to control, and it's refractory to typical first-line anteriorly-based uh, ther therapies such as nasal packing or even topical vasoconstriction and pressure. There are multiple guideline statements for the evaluation and management of patients that do exist and are constantly updated. There are many guidelines that are even written specifically for special situations. And there's an armamentarium of treatment options uh, that's very broad, includes a wide range of medical, surgical, and interventional radiology type options. Um, while there are algorithmic strategies, some of these uh, algorithms may be changed based on provider preference and the availability of different resources. Some key points from this chapter um, include, again, that most bleeding is anterior in nature. It can be managed on an outpatient basis. It can be managed with localized uh, therapies and care, um, even when going beyond the typical first-line treatment strategy, which is just uh, topical vasoconstriction and pressure and allowing the patient to heal. Um, if first-line therapies fail, as discussed, certainly um, a provider sh sh uh, uh, can and should consider more robust uh, packing or potentially even surgical or interventional radiologic options. Really, caution should be exercised in patients with unique clinical situations, such as the anticoagulated patient, and the provider should really consider the indication for using the uh, anticoagulant. Certainly also, um, uh, patients uh, and providers should consider patients with unique uh, situations, such as those with HHT, who may have more systemic manifestations of bleeding and be at risk for recurrent bleeding and complications related to those uh, typical second-line therapies, which may be less effective in this patient population. Some suggested reading from this, uh, uh, from this chapter and associated were discussed within the lecture. Um, however, uh, again, the American Academy of Otolaryngology Clinical Practice Guidelines were published in 2020. There are, however, many societal-based guidelines um, that, again, to this worldwide audience, may, you may want to consider from uh, your country of origin or depending on where you practice. There are many excellent surgical videos and high-level reviews of uh, nuanced surgical therapies, such as the use of sphenopalatine artery uh, ligation for the management of refractory epistaxis. I will show my sources here, and I would like to thank you for your attention, listening, and again, for being invited to contribute to this virtual textbook chapter. Thanks so much.